was about 5.45 in the morning and my director of operations, my number two guy in the squadron called and said, hey sir, I'm sure you're tracking that there's a soccer team stuck in a cave in Thailand. It's a long way in. Most of them don't even know how to swim, let alone dive. And we're all wondering how this is going to possibly work. And to be honest, the prospects are bleak. So we go into the cave and it was completely dark, but I could just sense like, oh my gosh, there's like 12 children and a coach in here. And I'm just in the entrance way and I'm spooked out. I can't even imagine. Talking to a lot of the experts that do cave diving as a hobby, we're like, man, this is one of the five most dangerous caves I've ever been in, in my career. And, and that was kind of, you know, the hair stands up on the back of your neck. The first thought is they're not going to get out. I mean, the kids, we've done recoveries before with live people, and it's all about panic underwater. I was always confident we could get them out. It was getting them out alive. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to tell you of a story about a miraculous cave rescue that occurred in Thailand. It was called the Tam Luang Cave Rescue. The story actually occurred due to these, yeah, due to these 13 boys. It was a football team, 12 boys with their coach, called the Wild Boars. After, on Wednesday, June 23rd, they decided to go to, uh, they decided going trekking in the mountains after their football practice. Their parents were aware of the trekking, but they did not know what would follow. So, as it was June, it was monsoon season where it was raining heavily. When it rains there, it pours. So what happened is, later that evening, the parents started to worry because the kids didn't return back home. And everyone started contacting each other and they were like, okay, did, did my boy come to your place? Uh, did your boy get back? And then the distraught started happening. What happened is that they knew that they were going to the Tam Luang Cave and they all headed there. Upon arriving there, what they found was a line of bicycles with football gears. So they started calling out the names of their boys. They called out names and names and names, but there was no response. At this point, the panic started. What happened is that they called the authority, first going to the police. The police came in. Came in. They went to the entrance of the cave to find out that it was flooded with water as it was monsoon season. Now, of course, the police couldn't handle the situation on their own, so what they did, they contacted the army. The army contacted the Thai Navy SEALs. They required divers in here as it was flooded. The governor got involved as well. They had a plan, they tried to go in, and the only thing they could do was just take a few steps inside the cave. One of the British uh, cavers who was residing in Thailand at that moment, he told them that it's about time that we call international help. And that's when he gave them the names of the professional cave divers from all over the world calling for help to save these 13 boys. We had 27 countries actually helping Thailand in this process, in this rescue. The first two that came in were from Britain and they, came, they started their diving course on the 27th of June. They kept going around and around and around, and they couldn't find the kids until one day, which is after seven days of diving, July the 2nd, they found the kids, all 13 of them sitting on a ledge in about four kilometers from the entrance. Now, what happened is the trail to the unknown started. They all started mapping out the plan. Okay, this is how we're going to extract them. This is what we need. This is who we need. And the beautiful part about this rescue is that not only people internationally coming in or flying to Thailand, it was the people, or the Thai people themselves, who were so passionate about saving these children that they started to uh, help them in different ways. So there were some taking shifts to cook, to supply food. There were some actually doing laundry, for crying out loud. There was a laundry room there helping everyone else. It was just like a big team, a united team working together to save those 13 boys. 
So now they know that, okay, we're gonna save these boys and we have the plan. But how are we gonna do it? I mean, how are they gonna get out? So they started calling in doctors. They started calling in anyone who can help in this. And this, unfortunately, the sad part about this cave rescue was one casualty, and it was Sergeant Saman Kunan. He lost his life during, ch uh, during the interchanging of his oxygen tank. That's when everyone thought about, that's when things got complicated, to be more honest. And everyone was thinking that, okay, there is a risk of losing lives here. We're not just talking about 13 people, we're, but we're talking about thousands and thousands of people who are helping us in this rescue. It did not discourage them. I would say it encouraged them even further to go and rescue those kids. So, Doctor, uh, sorry, the Sergeant Saman Kanan's life doesn't go in vain. Okay, everything was planned. This is what we have. You've got the entrance and where the boys are. It's about four kilometers. And that takes about three to four hours one way. Okay, we have the plan, we've got the narrow passages, but the kids don't know how to swim, let alone diving. How are they gonna come out? Of course, in this case, we needed a doctor. And this doctor of ours is called Dr. Richard Harris. He's an Australian anesthesiologist who also happens to be a professional cave diver. So he was called in and he, they required a plan from him. How are they going to be extracted? The first thing they had to tackle in the medical aspect was first of all, hypothermia. The second thing was how the gear is going to be chosen for these people. So their mask, their wetsuits, all these things were prepared before. The third part was sedation because the first rule to extract these or to rescue them was not to panic. So they had to go for sedation, which we'll get to it in a bit. And after that, the extraction process itself. Now, talking about tackling hypothermia, they don't have those fancy shancy bear huggers that we all have, that the privilege that we have. So what could they do? What is the most simple thing that they could get? And that was foil sheets. They got regular fold sheets and they covered all of them. They gave them extra, so two or three per person. Another thing to tackle the hypothermia was to actually double or triple their wetsuits. All right, we got to that point. Now, the mask. The mask was tried on volunteer kids beforehand and they were, um, they were actually fitted according to the ages of those kids. Okay. This looks like a regular mask, a diving mask. The only interesting part, or the interesting part in this mask was that they added pressure or positive pressure ventilation. So basically this was like a BiPAP. But they had to put this BiPAP on 80% oxygen just in case they got apneic. So imagine having this mask, I mean, I'm very claustrophobic, I don't know about you, putting that on my face would make, would really kill me, let alone going into those very narrow caverns of the cave. So you can imagine the panic they can go through. Right, so, sorry. So what happened is, you know how we're all, I wouldn't say consultants, but we're, we know this fact and our textbooks say the same thing, that decreased level of consciousness is a contraindication to BiPAP. Do we all agree to this or not? In some way. Our textbooks say that. Well, Dr. Richard Harris was like, not today. I need to sedate them. I need to decrease their level of consciousness in order for me to rescue them. So what did they do for sedation? There were three medications that were given to all the kids that we had, including the coach. The first, of course, our friend was, sorry, was Xanax, Alprazolam. Each kid received a tablet or 0.5 milligram orally of Xanax. They were told that you might feel a little funny, but it's okay, it's gonna get better. Okay, moving on from Xanax, what did they go to? They went to the mighty, I, this, this drug is my favorite to be honest, and that is ketamine, okay? Now, yes, you would think about it, ketamine, yes, sedate them for a bit, and then we can see how they go. But the thing is, they did not have any monitors. They did not have any 
airway, they did not have their double setup, let's say. So well, how did they even calculate the doses? Usually it would be one to two milligrams per kg, but in this, in, in this case, it was actually five milligrams per kg as an induction dose. That is a general anesthetic induction dose. Not only that, because the traveling period was about three to four hours, so they had to basically have, give it every hour or every 45 minutes. So the next dose, the top of dose was actually two and a half milligrams per kg. At one instance, what happened is that one of the boys did get over sedated and he did become bradyphnic. What they did is they extracted him from the water, they, in a spooning position, they maintained his patent airway for 30 minutes. When he got back to normal, they jammed him with ketamine again and put him back in water. Now, the third drug that was given was atropine. I'm not really aware of the atropine dose because it wasn't mentioned, but it was given IM as well to counteract the effect of hypersalivation of ketamine. Okay, so we got our masks, or we tackled the hypothermia, we got our mask, we got our medication, now let's extract them. Per person or per uh, boy, there were two divers traveling three to four hours one way. Right. Now, the thing about this cave rescue, I know I had to talk about the medical aspect, and it's very interesting, and how ketamine was given five milligrams per kg. But to be honest, what really stupefied me in this, or what really got to me, is how the whole world came together for these 13 boys who were just having fun, who were just being adventurous. People left everything they had, and they came to save these boys. And that is what I call compassion. Basically, this cave rescue showed us that, or showed, portrayed us humanity at its finest. When we work together, just like how we work in ED, we have teamwork. We, we don't care where the patient come from, uh, comes from. We don't care who the patient is. We don't care what he does in his life. Our main goal is to save him. It's about him, not us. And that is what I called compassion. I am a very strong believer in compassion. I do talk about it sometimes during my shift. Some people laugh at me, but I think this is the basic instinct every human being should have. When you have such a, it was a disaster. It was a local disaster that went internationally. And I am so proud of the world to help these people who, who needed them the most. And we got this solved. We got these kids, these 13 boys, 13 boys out of billions and billions of people. It doesn't matter, right? But no, it did. And everyone helped them. And that's why compassion is so important in our lives, especially in our jobs. Now, before I end my talk, since we were talking about ketamine, I came across something beautiful on Twitter. And if I'm not mistaken, it was tweeted by Dr. Howie Mel and then it was modified by Mr. Ketamine, I call him. I think it's Ketamine H. So this is what it said. Our Ketamine, who disassociates in Thai caverns, hollowed by thy name, thy K-hole come, thy sedation be done, under water as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily procedures, and forgive us our nerve blocks, and for we forgive as we forgive those who use midazolam against us. Lead us not into over-sedation, but deliver us from propofol. For ketamine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of FOMED, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Lastly, I'm about to end my talk. I would like to just teach you something very simple in Thai. And that's how to say thank you. And that's how I will end my talk. Oh, yeah. So here it goes. It's okay. Kapun kap. Okay. Thank you very much.